you know, Mousy told me one time, like, uh, they started rehearsing some jazz tune. And James Brown looked at the band like, y'all ain't going to get, y'all ain't going to learn this from no McBride. Oh, no. <laughs> We had, well, for the COVID, we had to move everybody back. So I was doing interviews from very far away. Right. And now we were, we're like a foot away from one another. I like it. I feel comfortable. There you go. You know, I feel like we could hold hands through the whole interview. I'm sure we could. <laughs> <laughs> Will we? I don't know. <laughs> How about instead of holding hands, we just listen to some music? Take a listen to this. <laughs> So that's The Temptations and Papa with the Rolling Stone. The first song you learned on bass, is that right? You're good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that I, is I, I'm right about that, right? That's correct. T- t- tell me a little bit about that. Well, when I was nine years old, I got my first electric bass. Uh, my mother brought me my first electric bass, and um, uh, my parents had already split up by then, but my father is a, a great, great bassist. And so he came over and gave me uh, my first, like my first bass lesson, and uh, that was the song I learned how to play. I mean, a pretty simple song to learn how yeah, to play. Yeah, yeah. But one thing I learned early is that uh, it's not about the notes; it's about the groove. It's about where you put it. Right. You know. Right. So the 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 notes are one thing, but placing them where they feel correct. Yeah. You know, that was that was the main thing. Yeah, there's a difference between da 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 and That's right. That's right. Ba gong ba gong bum 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 bum. Exactly. I mean, you even sing it differently. And it wasn't just your dad, wasn't don't you come from a family of bass players? Yes, and my great uncle, he also plays the bass as well. I love the way you describe him where you said like he was a caricature of a jazz bass player. Oh, he's he's the man. He he he's still the man. Is he still around? <laughs> he's still around. What was his name? Howard Cooper. What and how, when you say he is like the caricature of a jazz bass player, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, uh, he, he he always had a cigarette, and uh, he would always have like a a, a beret, wire <laughs> rim glasses, you know, goatee. Yeah. Uh, everybody is cat or baby. Right. You know, uh, always spoken slang slash jazz terminology, and uh, when he would play records for me. He would always sing along uh, or, or play air bass, you know. So just watching him listen to music was a wonderful, wonderful experience. So with a family full of bass players, why did you start out on trombone? Well, I didn't start out on trombone. when I, I, I started playing the electric bass yeah. when I was nine. And then uh, my mother saw that I was getting serious about this. Yeah. And she decided that, we, well, you need to go to a school that has a good music program. Yeah. Now, by that time, I had already fallen deeply in love with the music of James Brown. Yeah. And most of my favorite moments on a lot of James Brown's records were the trombone solos of Fred Wesley. Yeah. And so when it was time to pick an instrument to play in the orchestra, instead of picking the double bass, I picked the trombone. And uh, the brass instructor heard me play the trombone, and he basically said, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> he didn't say that, but that's. I was reading in between the lines. Yeah. He said, "You know, we really could use a, a bass player in the orchestra." Yeah. Was, but I don't. I don't want to play bass. He's like, it, "You should. You should try the bass. Give it. Give me the trombone." Right. <laughs> so, best decision anyone has ever made for me in my life. Yeah, and you pick up the. Um, what's the story? You, you pick up the acoustic bass, like the upright bass, mm-hmm. and you go like, oh, actually, this is kind of the same as the electric yes, bass. Yes, yeah. exactly. I can do I can play beat it on this. Yes, exactly. I started playing beat it. And uh, it took a while for it to, uh, f- for me to, to really enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, first two weeks of playing the upright bass was kind of like, eh. But after a while, it, it grew on me. And it grew on me hard. And, and a lot of that was because of Uncle Howard. Watching him, having him in your life as this great upright bass player. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned James Brown. I want to play something else. Okay. Here he is, James Soul Brother Brown. Hey, you, you are very good. Oh, come on. Pay it back! Pay it back! Pay it back! I need some! 
Stop Man, there's really been nothing like it since, has there? Not really. Like, that's just occurring to me as I'm listening to you right now. <laughs> People have tried, but it, not, not the same effect. Because it's melodic, and it's punchy, and it's poppy, but it's also out there. Well, I mean, the thing about James Brown's music, like, w one of my favorite quotes of his is that uh, every instrument is a drum to him. They kind of alluded to that in the uh, biopic Get On Up, but the, the real essence of, of, like, once James Brown's music became you know, just singular. Yeah. Uh, everybody was was playing rhythm. The guitar was playing rhythm. Bass was playing rhythm. Drums were playing rhythm. Horns were playing rhythm. Uh, the background singers were were rhythmic. You yeah. know, so it was just like uh, rhythm all around. You know, if, if whoever laid out, there was some rhythm going to keep you dancing. I was reading this interview with you, and you said something that caught me. You said that James Brown's music for you when you were young was like armor. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Big time. Uh, well, no one ever believes it, but I got bullied quite a bit when yeah. I was a kid. Okay. You know? And uh, I was always physically bigger than a lot of my friends, and you know, I liked this old music. You know, My mother raised me on Motown and The Temptations. That music was not the music of, of my generation. You know, uh, our generation, you know, I, I pretty much, we grew up on disco. Yeah. So I was always 10 years behind yeah. with the music that I liked yeah. with all my friends. And so, you know, because of my size, I, you know, the music that I liked, I got teased a lot. And every time I heard James Brown, I, I was like, I'm, I'm protected. I'm good. So for me, the Sony Walkman was like the greatest invention ever because I could put James Brown on my headphones and just walk to school and be like, I'm bulletproof. No one can touch him. No one can touch me. I'd be afraid of meeting him, though. Like I, some of my heroes, like some of my heroes I've got to meet and they've been great. Some of my heroes I'm glad I didn't get to meet. Like like one of my favorite artists is Bill Monroe, like the founder of Bluegrass sure. Music. Sure. But like probably I'm kind of glad I didn't ever meet him because <laughs> I'm sure it would have been a tough right, situation. Right. I've. I mean, everything I know about James Brown, I might feel the same way. How was he when you met him first? Oh, I, I, I knew it was going to be uh, an escapade, shall we say. You know? <laughs> uh, I had done all my research on on James Brown, and uh, I knew that he he was uh, a lot. Yeah. You know, um, but I so deeply admired him. I was willing to withstand whatever turbulence was coming. The boy was there. Yeah, you know, it, you know, started out cool. Where were where, where were you? Like, tell me, tell me where you were when you first met him. Well, I, I, I first, you know, there's the kind of meet where you just, you know, you're a kid and you meet him backstage and you shake his hand. Hey, how are you, and, sir? And you know, he gives you an autograph. Uh, so that happened when I was 11. Yeah. Uh, and then I met him backstage at the Apollo Theater in 1994. Uh, when he was making what was to be his final live album at the Apollo. And uh, by that time, I knew a number of his band members. He didn't quite know who I was yet, but we had a little tiny bit of a conversation. It was just sort of like a another version of when I met him at 11, age 11. The following year, this was the summer of 95, um, I was on tour with this Verve Records all-star package, you know, it was like Roy Hargrove, Jimmy Smith, Nicholas Payton, Mark Whitfield, all of us on tour together. Cool. And uh, James Brown was on that festival, and we were all staying at the same hotel. By this time, my first album, Getting To It, had been released. Uh, I pretty much knew everyone in his circle but him at this point. So when we met in the lobby at the Vienna Hilton, I'll never forget it, uh, that's when he finally put two and two together, you know. Uh, so then we actually had a conversation about music, and uh, it, it, that was really a fun conversation. So over the next year or two, um, I'm thinking, well, let me take advantage of this. Now he knows who I am. You know, maybe we can, I'm so naive, maybe we could collaborate on a project together, you know. Uh, so I knew that he had done a jazz album called Soul on Top with Louis Belson's big band. When was that? 1969. Any good? Uh, hell yeah. Yeah. 
And so I thought maybe we could recreate that album. Yeah. You know, my big band and him. Yeah. And uh, he sounds so impressed. He, the w- number one, that I knew the album. Two, that he knew that that I knew that he loved jazz and that he, he understood the aesthetics of jazz, you know. And then somewhere along the way, uh, there was a crash and burn. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, he... Um, I, two of my very closest friends in James Brown circle uh, was the great Martha High, who sang background with him for many, many years, yeah. and his drummer, Robert Thompson, who's known as Mousy. Mousy was kind of the guy that got me into James Brown's circle. Unbelievable drummer, by the way. Yes, yeah, yes. Incredible. And so I was super tight with the two of them. Yeah. And uh, James Brown invited me to his uh, Christmas party, and th- this was in 96. Uh, and uh, in the interim, not only did he invite me to his Christmas party, he invited me to perform at his birthday bash, which was maybe six months after the Christmas party. So I'm now like on James Brown's calendar. I'm on his Christmas list, you know. So I go, I fly to Augusta and uh, go to this party. And while I'm at the party, I'm sitting at this table with Martha and Mousy and Danny Ray, the, the real you know, level A James Brown crew. Yeah. And um, the party started wonderfully. And by the end of the night, his whole vibe had just done a, he'd just taken a 180. What happened? So at the beginning of the party, it was just like, Mr. McBride, it's great to see you, son. And I told all my friends, Chris McBride coming to the party. Y'all know. Y'all don't know. And, um, <laughs> you know, he told me how he was going to sing a jazz tune with the house band. He's like, Son, I ain't sang no jazz in a long time. You, you, you sparked it back up in me, son. You know, and then uh, by the end of the night, uh, you know, everybody was taking pictures on the way out, and um, I said, "Mr. Mr. Brown, can we get a picture before I go?" He's like, uh, "So me, Martha High, and and Mr. Brown pose for a photo," and uh, and James Brown's like, "I see what you're doing, son. You don't fool me. I'm hip to you. You don't think I see it." I see it. What? I was like, excuse me? I thought he was being funny. Yeah. You know? And uh, he said, you trying to steal my people from me. You're trying to steal Miss Hyde from me. I see you sitting over there with all my people. And again, I thought he was joking. Yeah. You know, I was like, steal? Like, what do you mean steal? Yeah. And so he, I remember the specific quote was, uh, you trying to take him for your own organization. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow. <laughs> Wow, this, this man's a little paranoid. Yeah, a little bit. You know? And I was like, Mr. Brown, no, 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 no. I, I have I have no use for Mousy or Miss High or Mr. Ray. I, you know, we're just friends. He's like, nah, son, I got I got my eye on you. <laughs> and then over the next several months, you know, Mousy would call me up. He's like, hey, man, you know, Brown was talking about you at rehearsal today. Now, this was mixed feelings because, wow, I'm so much in James Brown's head now that he's talking about me at rehearsal. Yeah. And, you know, Mousy told me one time, like, uh, they started rehearsing some jazz tune, and James Brown looked at the band like, y'all ain't gonna get, y'all ain't gonna learn this from no McBride. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) You were in his head, man. Yeah, Mousy Mousy told me that uh, Mr. Brown said one time, uh, he said, yeah, Mousy, I I know you in touch with McBride. (laughs) You tell him all my secrets, ain't you? <laughs> and I was like, wow. He was paranoid. Him. He was paranoid. You know? But I was like, I said, but Mousy, why why is he paranoid? What does he think I'm gonna do? You know? Yeah. I'm just a jazz dude, you yeah. know, who wants to I'm dying to play with him one day. Yeah. You know? And so finally, I just I started to hang back. Yeah. Because it was just getting too you know, like one day I called him on the phone because he never did answer my question about soul on top. Yeah. And so uh, I called him on the phone one day, and uh, unfortunately, he was in his office that day. <laughs> and uh, I had the equivalent of uh, a cannonball being shot through my body. <laughs> he yelled at you. He... Oh, son, I ain't working with you. In fact, you can't even play. Oh, wow. I mean, he just, it, it just, it got, it got. That's really hard bad. for you, man. This is your hero. It was, you know, and even though I knew that. 
that was a potentiality, if that's a word. Yeah. Um, that it still didn't feel great when it happened. Yeah. You know, because I'd heard from the best musicians that ever played with James Brown, Bootsy Collins, Maceo Parker, Fred Wesley, Jabbo Starks. He yelled at them on the regular. Yeah. You know, told them they had no talent. I don't need you. All that kind of <laughs> stuff, you know. So I thought, what's little old me? Of course, at some point, he's going to do that to me. Yeah. You know, and he did. Yeah. Cool. And uh, it didn't feel good. It still hurt. It still hurt. Yeah. But then somewhere along the way, you know, like I said, let me fall back. I'm leaving his circle, you know. Uh, I still m- remain really close friends with Mousy and Miss High, but Miss High left not too long after that, and she went with Maceo, Maceo Parker. Mousy stayed there till the end, so, uh, you know, I'll keep in touch with Mousy. And then in 2006, uh, I'm sorry, 2005, I was named creative chair uh, for jazz with the L.A. Philharmonic. And uh, so I, I curated 12 concerts per season, eight at the Hollywood Bowl, four at Walt Disney Concert Hall. So I thought, hmm, do I even dare uh, resurrect that old idea yeah. of James Brown and the Christian McBride big band playing soul on top. I said, well, it's now or never. Yeah. So I called his manager and, uh, much to my shock, uh, Charles Bobbitt was his name. He, he passed away. Uh, he said, oh, man, Mr. Brown, he, he told me that, uh, you know, I spoke to him and, he said he loved to do it. He said he's very proud of you. He's been keeping his eye on your career all these years. And, uh, yeah, he's he's down to do it. Man, I I was I was frozen in my tracks for days because I didn't think it would that it would be that quick of a yes. Yeah. So you now know? you got to do it. And uh, but, you know, the fact that he was just like, you know, when I finally saw him, uh, he came to New York and I went to go see him. You know, he's like. Son, I'm proud of you. I turned out to, you turned out to be a big man in, in the music business, oh, wow. you know. And uh, so he was the nicest man in the world. How, how did you feel when you actually got to play the instrument on stage with him? That was uh, that's one of those feelings you'll never you'll never forget. You know, it, it was the rehearsal uh, when we did the first rehearsal uh, at Center Staging in Burbank. You know, it was his band and my big band facing each other. You know, and uh, there's James Brown in the middle looking at my band and and, and we're rehearsing. And uh, when we played that first note and he came in singing, you know, I was the MD, so I had to hold it. I had to keep it together, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole time I was like, breathe deep, breathe deep, concentrate, concentrate. It's a 12-bar blues. You'll be okay, <laughs> you know. But I was, man, I was just like, I am finally playing with James Brown. Can't oh, believe wow. it. And he, he passed on not long He passed that. on three months, three and a half months after that concert. So right at the end of his life, he finally got to... And we had been talking about... <clears throat> excuse me. We we had been talking about doing it in New York. So we were going to do it again yeah. sometime in uh, 2008. Yeah. I mean... S- Central Park Summer Stage. We, you know, we, j- we were just kind of going through our options. I'm glad you got to do that, man. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad you. I'm glad the story doesn't end with James Brown yelling at you. Oh no, just the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I thought it was going to end with so I played with him and I got fined. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. It's, that that concert at the Hollywood Bowl was all fun. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Let's let's go to some of Christian's music. Let's go to the music in in nine. So you went to Juilliard. You left after a year. Um, you were playing a lot of, of gigs and, and clubs in New York. You're playing with a lot of other people. Uh, so let's talk about this record, the, 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 one of the records you referenced earlier. Take a listen to this. From 94, that's my guest Christian McBride with the title track to his album, Getting To It. Here, here's what I find interesting about you, is that you do, you come from funk, mm-hmm. and you went to school with the roots. You went to the creative high school with uh, Amir and, and Tariq from- and, and Black Thought. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tariq, from, yep. uh, from, from the roots. You could have played any kind of genre of music, and you mm-hmm. have, but you could mm-hmm. have. Can you tell me what it is about jazz? That got you what it is about jazz because it's a, it's a, not a path that every musician of your level right. takes, you know. 
I first of all, it was the most difficult, and I loved the challenge in finding a way to play it and play it well. And uh, I also have to acknowledge, like my my best friend throughout high school was the late great Joey D. Francesco, and Joey was playing professional gigs at age nine. You know, so he's he was a true child prodigy. You know, yeah. his his feet could barely touch the organ, and but yet here he is. People are paying to see him play yeah. in clubs around Philly, and so here I am going to school every day with Joey, and you know he's playing you know all this you know, Wynton Kelly stuff on the piano and then go to the organ and play like Jimmy Smith. And it's like, man, you know, how do you do that? You know, and so between my between Uncle Howard, my dad, going to school every day with Joey and being around all of these great musicians in the city of Philadelphia, jazz seemed the most interesting. It seemed the most personal. Like, you truly knew kind of who a person was yeah. through the way they played. Yeah. Like if you go hear a funk band, the drummer had to keep the same groove yeah. all the time. Yeah. And you're kind of following the directions of the band leader, yeah. you know. But in jazz, you get ten drummers to play time. They all play time ten different ways. And you're learning who they are from that. You're learning my, who they are my, from my, that. My brother in law's a, a jazz musician, um, and he doesn't talk a lot. I mean, he talks, talks yeah. a lot to me, but he's you know, um, and he's going to hear this. But but sometimes when I watch him play, I'll go, "That's you. You're that's you. That's yeah. who you are. That's, that's right. The, you're talking to me right now. Yep. That's as what you're playing right now is as you as having a conversation. And that's you. what I love about jazz. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the movement revisited, shall we? Sure. So um, this is the piece you're playing here in Canada. It just had its vinyl release. Uh, this is a work that has been with you for 25 years now. You first wrote it in 1998. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about then. Mm -hmm. So Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, Muhammad Ali. Back then, what inspired it? I, I received a commission from the Portland Arts Society in, in Maine, not Oregon. And uh, they simply ask, you know, we want you to write a, a, a piece, an extended work uh, for some black history programming that we're doing. Uh, the only, <clears throat> excuse me, the only stipulation of the commission was that it, it involved the choir. I was like, man, I know nothing about writing or arranging for choirs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they said, we, we know someone you should meet. And he introduced me to J.D. Steele. And J.D. Steele, basically, I, I told him, I said, look, man, I, I know nothing about writing for voices. He said, well, I do. <laughs> you you tell me, the, you give me the smallest little musical idea, and I'll, I'll blow it up for you. Yeah. And uh, so he became my collaborator in this piece. But just thinking of the content of the piece, you know, I didn't know, like, do I want to write a piece of music about a particular... A, a moment or a, a period or a person or persons, you know, I, I mean, I was only 26. So, you know, and I had no experience in writing extended work, you know, so, um, I did the best I could. And, uh, I said, well, let me whittle it down to four people who, whose legacies mean a lot to me. And it was those those four that are in the piece. And at that time, it was just for a uh, jazz quartet and a choir. Um, so, you know, I don't even remember what it sounded like in 1998. Yeah. It was woefully underdeveloped, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. You met Rosa Parks, man. I did. I met her twice. Uh, we played the National Black Caucus in Washington, D.C. in 1987. And Rosa Parks sat right in the front and watched us. And, uh, man, that was that was powerful. So we, we met her and uh, just the kindest, most gentle woman, you know. Yeah. And uh, I met her again at a, at a hotel, I believe, I think it was in New York. Yeah. And, you know, just getting off the elevator and, you know, I was like, you know, hello, Mrs. Parks, you know, and uh, we didn't really get a chance to talk then, but, you know, just her presence, man. I also had a chance to meet Muhammad Ali. Did you? Yes. And, man, the closer I got to him, 
his his energy was so otherworldly. I mean, it was like the closer I got to him, it was like the energy, the, it was like a force field. You know, just like, nee, nee. like yeah. <laughs> it's like, man, it's like I'm trying to walk to him, but I can't. <laughs> was was, was he unwell at the time? Was that when he? Yeah, this was uh, <clears throat> this was at the grand opening of the the Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky. Right. And uh, and he was there. Wow. Wow, what it would have been like to meet him and oh, see him. Oh, man. Do you, um, in terms of what was inspiring this piece or what you heard or what you wanted to get out through this piece in any eight, did anything feel different now when you're performing? Oh, yeah. A- extra musically, I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, and, big time. Well, we played the, 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 what I call the new and improved movement revisited in, uh, the summer of 2008 at Walt Disney Concert Hall, we had Sylvia St. James and her choir. Uh, and by that time, we had separate narrators. Wendell Pierce read MLK. Uh, Carl Lumley read Malcolm X. Uh, the late James Avery, um, also known as Uncle Phil. Uncle Phil from yeah. Fresh, Fresh Prince Billy. Uh, he read Ali. Mm-hmm. And Loretta Devine read uh, Rosa Parks. And... Uh, it it was it was great. It was it was we had a really wonderful experience. Then five months later, Barack Obama is elected the forty fourth president of of the United States. And uh the Detroit Jazz Festival booked the movement revisited and Terry Pontremoli, who was the director at that time, she says, How about if we uh give you a little small commission to expand the piece? Now, she did not specifically say, you know, write it for Obama, but, you know, I started kind of reading in between the lines. So it's like a commission to expand it. Hmm. What would I expand it to? You know, I said, okay, yeah, I get it. So uh, sometimes it gets mistaken that the fifth and final movement is for Obama. Mm -hmm. It's not for Obama. Mm -hmm. It's for what happened the night he was elected president. And so the name of the the, na- the name of the fifth and final movement is Apotheosis, November fourth, two thousand eight. Apotheosis means turning. It's sort of like the the apex. You yeah. know, it's like s- something happens, and then something great, the the pinnacle. So you know? so the, the, the these these um, civil rights leaders had done all this incredible work. You got it. And then the pinnacle of that you is got look, it. the forty fourth president of the United States is a black man. You got it. There's something about the music that has been able to express social movements as well, Mm -hmm. especially, of course, given the origins of the music, Mm -hmm. black liberation movements, black social justice movements, black civil rights movements. In addition to personal expression, is there something about the music that lends itself well to that that sort of expression? Yes. And and that's not just jazz that's all black music that's gospel music that's uh blues folk music whatever you want to call it because the social issues of any time in our history has always been addressed in the music so it's weird how the narrative of black music in conjunction with uh social movements kind of get put together I find most pundits who I who I see, they kind of don't go much further behind Marvin Gaye's "What's Going On." Right. Like somehow that's the pinnacle yeah. of someone capturing the black experience in one album. And while I agree that that is a perfect album, yeah, there's no no question about that. That album is almost late in terms of addressing social issues. And I mean, even talking about war, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, you go back and you listen to Sonny Rollins, yeah. uh, the Freedom Suite. Yeah. You know, that was made in what, 1957? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, Max Roach, uh, Freedom Now. I mean, Alice Coltrane, like. But, you know. but even before that, I mean, like, Duke Ellington composed Black, Brown, and Beige in, I believe, 1943. And when he debuted that piece in front of an all-white audience at Carnegie Hall, 
he announced to the audience, he says, uh, Black, Brown, and Beige is about the Negro experience in America. Yeah. And like now, you know, Duke would be called woke for doing that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can trace the history of 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 black music being one and the same with uh, what we see in the streets or, or what we feel about what we're uh, experiencing, you know. Uh, but by the same token, Questlove says something that, oh man, it, it it shook me up. It was so awesome. It was something to the effect of, because we are black artists, we should not feel. I, I'm I'm so paraphrasing, but it was something like, uh, as black artists, people expect us only to write about the black experience. Yeah, like yeah. we can't create just to create. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when you see people like a Prince, you know, or a Wayne Shorter, who don't always write about the black experience, but they, they have such vivid imagination, they write about something that we can't quite, we don't really know what that is. But it's amazing. Duke Ellington was like that as well, you know. So um, I think that the, the black experience – the human experience, uh, in terms of the music, you should not feel obligated to always write from a place of pain. Yeah. You know, you should be obligated to write exactly what you feel. You know what I mean? And and, and if, if, if your experience is different from, and, and it is, because we all have different experiences, you should write that. Yeah. And and be okay with that. There doesn't need to be a lane for you to figure no. out. No. Not at all. Man, I could talk to you about music forever. Thanks for coming in. Man, thanks for having me. This is fun. I, if, if I didn't have rehearsal in, a, in an hour, I'd stay here with you some more. Let's cancel it. Come on, we'll hang out. <laughs> they know it. They're, they, you know, they should know it. What, you, what, would you, what would James Brown do? That's my question. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs>